thank you very much, Katerina. It's a pleasure to be here today. This is actually my second visit to the University of Fribourg. I uh, visited here last in 1983 when uh, uh, I, I was a sabbatical visitor at the Biotzentrum in Basel, uh, where my daughter was born. And uh, I'm now a grandfather as a result of uh, her later activities. Uh, so the, the university, of course, has changed quite dramatically since I was here last time. It's a pleasure to meet a number of uh, your colleagues here today and the students, uh, very enthusiastic students who were particularly delighted to take me for chocolate after, the, after the lunch. Well, <clears throat> this afternoon I'm going to tell you um, about uh, the history of my interest in cellular membranes, but I'll focus, um, uh, for the most part, early on the cell biology of biological membranes and how they interrelate in a process called protein secretion, or how cells export proteins. Well, to begin, um, I'll tell you a little bit about the influences that led me to want to understand how cells put their membranes together. When I grew up in Southern California, uh, one of my birthdays, I received a toy microscope, just a little plastic toy microscope, and I remember collecting a jar of pond scum at a local riverbed. And um, I'm sure many of you have had this experience. I took a drop of this pond scum and put it on a glass slide. And suddenly, looking through this very low power lens, one could see the world of uh, microorganisms, uh, really something that you can't see with the naked eye. But it was an amazing in its diversity and activity. And I was endlessly fascinated. I'd spent many evenings in my bedroom uh, looking through this microscope trying to understand how these things could move around and, and eat each other and bump off, to, off of walls. It was uh, like a, uh, you know, a real life cartoon. One evening I expressed um, my uh, interest at the family dinner and my father was a little skeptical that I could possibly see anything of any value in a toy microscope and I resolved that evening to save uh, what was then a princely sum of money, $100 in 1962, to buy a student professional microscope. And so I used to babysit and mow lawns and uh, deliver newspapers, and I put all of my earnings in an envelope in the closet in my bedroom, but I could never quite get to the $100 that I needed because my mother kept stealing the money <laughs> to buy, you know, groceries and things like that. <clears throat> so. One Saturday morning, I remember vividly, I was uh, mowing a neighbor's lawn, and I, I was so upset that I uh, rode my bicycle to a local police station, and I told the duty officer that I was running away from home because my mother was stealing my money and I couldn't get my microscope. <laughs> so they called my father in, and uh, he went into the captain's office, and there were some words exchanged, and he came out looking very severe, but I learned a valuable life lesson that afternoon because we drove right from the police station to a pawn shop in a nearby city, and we bought this um, pride of my, of my youth, a Bosch and Lam student professional microscope, which I then spent the years remaining, when I was living at home, using in annual science fair projects that were on display at the school and at the county and ultimately at the state. This really was how I became interested in science. Now, um, of course, well, I went away to college and uh, they had better microscopes, so I put this microscope away. And in college, uh, I became interested in how viruses replicate, particularly how the DNA chromosomes of viruses are copied in an infected bacterial cell. I had the opportunity to work in a research laboratory for several years where one used uh, physical techniques to isolate chromosomes from these infected bacteria and resolve them and try to deduce how the strands of the bacterial chromosome could, could be copied. Now, in the course of this work, I became aware of the pioneering efforts of the, one of the leading enzymologists of the uh, second half of the 20th century, uh, uh, a man named Arthur Kornberg, who in um, the 1950s uh, had discovered an enzyme called DNA polymerase that was a really an unusual enzyme for its time. The DNA polymerase had the ability to read a strand of DNA and take its instructions uh, from copying 
by complementary base pairing the uh, nucleotides in a strand of DNA. And he assumed, and uh, did experiments over the course of the next decade, uh, to attempt to demonstrate that this enzyme was involved in replicating the bacterial chromosome, and of course, by extension, that this enzyme would be involved in replicating all chromosomes. And in the last couple of years of my undergraduate research work at UCLA, uh, I became in particular familiar with two publications of Dr. Kornberg that were uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, shown here, published in 1967. He showed in collaboration with a postdoctoral fellow and then a prominent scientist at Caltech, Robert Sinsheimer, that a single-stranded circular DNA molecule from a particular virus called Phi X174 could, in the test tube, be copied to a complementary strand with just the enzyme that he had purified, the DNA polymerase. He could then remove that complementary strand, a synthetic strand, and uh, return it back to a fresh uh, source of the DNA polymerase and make the viral strand a copy of the complement. And that viral strand could then be introduced into bacteria, which would uh, cause the virus to replicate and to produce new infectious virus um, particles. So that was a powerful demonstration that this enzyme was capable of copying a whole chromosome faithfully to make the, the gene products, the proteins that were necessary for virus duplication. And so he uh, assumed that this was uh, the final evidence that would be necessary to demonstrate that the enzyme was involved in chromosome replication, but there were skeptics in the field who for various reasons doubted that this was the enzyme. And one noted skeptic, two years after this, these monumental papers, did a completely different sort of investigation using bacterial genetics. A man named John Cairns, who was then the director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York, did the following really simple, elegant experiment. He took a culture of bacteria, E. coli, exposed the culture to a chemical that causes mutations. He spread the colonies, uh, he spread the cells out on petri plates, and he allowed the cells to grow. Um, just um, at uh, 37 degrees, he picked individual colonies, clones of the mutagenized bacteria, broke the cells open, and did the enzyme assay for Kornberg's enzyme, and he discovered one clone that grew perfectly normally, but which, when broken open, showed no such polymerase activity. In other words, he isolated mutation in the gene that encodes the DNA polymerase and was able to show that that gene though it may be involved in making the polymerase, was not essential for cell division, therefore not essential for chromosome replication. He showed subsequently that these cells were um, hypersensitive to ultraviolet light under conditions where uh, mutations are introduced into the chromosome and must be repaired for the cell to survive. But this mutant could not repair its DNA. And he concluded, correctly as it turns out, that the Kornberg enzyme was not the replication enzyme, but was rather a DNA repair enzyme. Well, this was, at the time, really quite a revolutionary discovery, and it shook up the field of chromosome replication. And I had the privilege of then uh, going to the Kornberg lab and helping to establish a biochemical reaction that ultimately led to the isolation of the actual enzymes that are involved in replication. And uh, crucially for that work, we relied on bacterial mutants uh, that were defective in the genes required for replication, mutants that cause a defect that's thermosensitive, where the mutant protein works at room temperature but fails to work at body temperature or, or higher. And that um, was, for me, a, an, an incredibly valuable lesson, because I learned that in order to study a complicated process like chromosome replication, it's really necessary to use multiple techniques. That is, one should not rely on a single approach, in this case, biochemistry, but one should mix uh, biochemistry and some physiologic criterion, such as genetics, to really establish that a pathway that one studies through the isolation of enzymes is really an authentic, physiologically relevant event. And I introduced the, that logic because that has informed my subsequent career in the work that I'll tell you about now. I became interested after graduate school 
in understanding how biological membranes are put together. Here is a cartoon that shows uh, the um, elements of a typical biological membrane. It includes phospholipid molecules that have polar surfaces facing the interior of the cell or facing the cell exterior. <clears throat> and it includes acyl chains, fatty acids, that are hydrophobic and that uh, create um, the interior of a membrane that is uh, insulating and would otherwise allow no small molecules to pass back and forth across a membrane. However, cells, of course, obviously do have molecules that pass back and forth, and that is achieved through the intervention of integral membrane proteins uh, that often span the bilayer, molecules that are, for instance, channels or permeases or other molecules that may uh, serve as receptors to receive information. Hormones bind to the surface of the cell and transmit information into the cell interior. So the question that seemed most interesting to me at the end of my graduate career was, how is this structure, this complex uh, fluid structure, how is it put together in a precise way that would allow a cell to function? And how can this structure be expanded and duplicated in preparation for cell division. And I thought it might be possible to use the techniques of genetics and biochemistry to probe this fundamentally different kind of problem. Now, of course, there was a history of study on this problem. Uh, much of that history was uh, uh, pioneered by a uh, leading cell biologist uh, in the middle to late 20th century, a man by the name of George Pilate. George Pilate is shown here. He um, used as his primary tool uh, the electron microscope, uh, an instrument that uh, can bombard a uh, thin sliver of a cell uh, with an intense electron beam. But the thin sliver of the cell must be preserved so that it's not destroyed by the electron beam. Now, the instrument itself was invented in Germany, but uh, the, the techniques that allow a specimen to survive the intense bombardment and to reveal information was perfected in New York at Rockefeller University in the laboratory of Pilate and his colleagues. One example of a cell that they spent a lot of time investigating, and one that is important for all of us uh, today, is the beta cell of the pancreas. This is organized in clusters in the pancreas called the islets of Langerhans, and it consists of cells that are uh, professionally devoted to the production and secretion of insulin. So molecules that, uh, protein molecules that are made by animal cells, by human cells, are all made in the cytoplasm, stitched together by machines called ribosomes that stitch amino acids one next to another. But some of the molecules, and most of those molecules remain inside of the cell and function for the chemistry of life. But some of the molecules, and things like insulin, must be encapsulated and then discharged by uh, an elaborate mechanism called the secretory pathway. You can see some evidence of the organelles that are involved in the secretion of insulin. You can see these uh, granules. These are membrane-bounded granules that contain an internal, uh, almost crystalline array of, of insulin. So the process of secretion must involve the encapsulation of molecules like insulin. How does this happen? Well, Pilate turned his attention to a series of membranes, organelles, within pancreatic cells that convey molecules like insulin from station to station until these molecules are eventually exported outside of the cell. And let me show you a progression of images that uh, depict the um, steps that Pilate was able to discover. So here is the first step. It's an organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER for short. It consists of um, large, flat surfaces, often in envelopes that spread throughout the cytoplasm of a cell. And along these envelopes, one sees dark staining bodies that are the ribosomes that stitch amino acids next to one another to make proteins. In fact, it was Pilate in the mid-1950s who was the first to discover a ribosome in a section of, a, of a, uh, an animal cell. In the case of a cell in the pancreas, where almost all of the proteins that are made in the cell must be exported outside of the cell, the ribosomes are, for the most part, organized directly 
on the cytoplasmic surface of one of the ER membranes. And Pilate speculate, speculated that these ribosomes would be poised on the membrane, covering a channel, a hydrophilic channel, through which he imagined nascent secretory polypeptides emerging from the ribosome would penetrate until they uh, folded in the luminal interior. The lumen is a kind of a tubular network that um, spreads throughout the cell. It's kind of like a canal network into which molecules, having been made by ribosomes, passed across a membrane, come to rest, they fold, and then they wait being swept out to sea through the next stages in the secretory process. So Pilate was able to visualize this. He was able to isolate the membranes and to reproduce at least parts of this step in the test tube biochemically. The next station that Pilate focused on was actually discovered some 60 years earlier in Italy by a, a neuroscientist by the name of Camillo Golgi. Golgi uh, was interested in nerve cells, and he perfected various dyes that could be used to highlight different membranes that could be visualized in the light microscope. This was long before the advent of electron microscopy. One particular dye that he perfected highlighted this membrane, which in honor of his discovery after his death was referred to as the Golgi apparatus. Uh, it's a stack, apparently a stack of membranes um, in a distinct position within the cytoplasm of a cell, and at least morphologically quite different from the endoplasmic reticulum. But for 60 years after um, uh, Golgi's discovery, this organelle remained a kind of a curiosity. It was found everywhere, in plant cells, in microorganisms, in animal cells, and yet no one could really figure out what it was doing. It was often considered to be some kind of an artifact of the staining procedure that um, Golgi had devised. But Pilate was the one to figure out, as you'll see, that it's a station along the way that C receives and then transmits proteins like insulin from one step to the next in the pathway. The last station in this pathway that Pilate and others focused on is one where a granule, in this case of insulin, housed within a bilayer membrane, approaches the inner surface of the plasma membrane, the surface membrane of the cell, uh, and the approach is so close that most cytoplasmic contents are squeezed out. These membranes come within 10 angstroms of one, of one another before some event catalyzes the, mergen, the merger of these two membranes by a process called membrane fusion to produce a continuous bilayer, at which point the internal content of the granule can be expelled, the insulin in this case dissolves and is eventually distributed into the bloodstream. So this event, this key event, membrane fusion, can occur in a cell without breaching the bilayer. The cell can continue to grow and divide and expel molecules that uh, are intended for secretion. Now this step, membrane fusion, is repeated in many cells in the body. Indeed, it's repeated within a single cell many times. One example that you'll be aware of is in a nerve cell, shown here. So this is, in the case, this is actually a frog nerve cell. Uh, at, it, at the junction with a muscle cell, the so-called neuromuscular junction. And the nerve terminal includes a lot of small uh, particles. These are called vesicles. These are the uh, functional equivalent of the granules that house insulin. But in a nerve cell, what's being secreted is not insulin, but rather chemical neurotransmitters, molecules like uh, dopamine, which is deficient in patients with Parkinson's disease, or serotonin, that controls mood, or most importantly, acetylcholine, which is the major neurotransmitter in the brain and which is uh, gradually lost in patients who succumb to uh, Alzheimer's disease. So these vesicles are produced, they fill, they're filled up with chemical neurotransmitters, and then they uh, are lodged, docked, on the inside surface of a nerve terminal. And when this membrane uh, surrounding the nerve terminal is electrically activated, uh, a process of membrane fusion is triggered very rapidly to cause the neurotransmitters to be distributed into the space between, in this case, a nerve cell and a muscle cell. The space is called the synapse. And the chemical neurotransmitters diffuse across the synapse, 
bind to receptors on, in this case, the muscle cell, which ultimately leads to muscle contraction. Now, in the brain, there are billions of these innervations where nerve cells touch each other. Sometimes each nerve cell has thousands of such innervations. And in each case, information is being transmitted from one cell to, to, to the next through the intervention of neurotransmitters. And in each case, this step is absolutely critically controlled by a process of membrane fusion. Now, Pilate put all these observations together in the form of a simple temporal map that is shown here. Uh, he showed that newly synthesized proteins, like insulin, originate on ribosomes bound to the endoplasmic reticulum. They fold within this, in this case, uh, colored interior luminal space. They are then packaged into smaller uh, vesicles that target content to the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus serves to modify these proteins and to sort these proteins for different destinations within the cell. And some of them are packaged yet again now into granules, which are delivered to the perimeter of the cell and uh, a process of membrane fusion ultimately discharges their content to the cell exterior. Now, uh, Pilate was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1974. And at that time, I had just started as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, San Diego, with an interest in biological membranes. And I had the pleasure to uh, see Pilate give a version of his Nobel lecture, because the annual meeting of the American Society for Cell Biology that year was in San Diego. He had uh, come directly from Stockholm down to San Diego to deliver a version of the lecture that included a cartoon such as this. It was, uh, of course, a a great achievement. The cell biology community was thrilled with his uh, discoveries. But in my case, although it was clearly uh, quite dramatic and elegant, what struck me was, having been trained as a biochemist in a very reductionist approach, I was struck by the absence of any mechanistic insight uh, at all about his, how this process worked or was organized. In 1974, not a single molecule, not a single protein molecule or lipid had been ascribed a role at any point in this pathway. We knew nothing about how ribosomes could be organized on the surface of the ER. We knew nothing about the putative channel in the ER membrane through which polypeptides must pass to enter into the lumen. Nothing was known about how vesicles are pinched from a membrane. Nothing was known about how they progress through the Golgi. And finally, nothing, absolutely no catalyst, had been discovered to promote the fusion of membranes. And so, um, given my biochemical experience, it seemed uh, obvious that there must be a way to tease this complex pathway apart to discover the relevant proteins. Now, at the time, uh, I was struck also by the use of simple microorganisms to dissect complex pathways. Um, when I began my uh, independent work, at the University of California, Berkeley in 1976, uh, the um, simple organism uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, baker's yeast, had already been uh, developed as a um, promising model eukaryote, uh, an, an organism that could be used genetically to dissect complex pathways. Leland Hartwell, Paul Nurse had initiated studies on the progression of, event, of events that lead to the division of a yeast cell. They had genes, many genes that program individual steps that lead to the uh, uh, division of yeast cells to produce daughter cells. So it seemed to me and to my students that that would be an attractive way to start, to use yeast as an organism to try to understand how protein molecules might be secreted. So let's have a look at what a yeast cell looks like that might suggest that it uses a typical eukaryotic pathway. So here's a cluster of yeast cells such as you may see growing on the surface of a grape. Um, at the beginning of a cell division event, a mother cell sends out a small bud. Uh, and uh, during the 90 minutes or so before the cells can divide, the bud gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Ultimately, uh, the bud approaches the size of the mother cell, at which point the two cells divide in half. So it's a budding process of division. Now, it doesn't take much of a leap of imagination to guess that new surface material, including new membrane, 
must be added to the bud portion as the cell grows. So it should be a directed and restricted growth, perhaps involving the transmission of new membrane proteins by vesicle fusion. In fact, if you look by cutting a thin section through a yeast cell, it looks obviously very different than a pancreatic beta cell. You see an overwhelming abundance of ribosomes, since the cell is making so many proteins in such high amounts. But there are organelles. This is the yeast equivalent of the lysosome, called a vacuole. There are membranes largely op opposed to the plasma membrane that represent the endoplasmic reticulum. In other sections that you'll see, there's a nucleus with a, a two-membrane envelope. But uh, my first graduate student and I, my first student, Peter Novick and I, uh, were particularly interested with um, the small collection of vesicles congregating under the bud portion of a dividing cell. We uh, guessed that these vesicles would be carriers to deliver proteins for secretion into the cell wall that surrounds this cell. These cells growing on the surface of a great harvest carbohydrates, polysaccharides, which must be degraded to produce sugars that could be taken up by active transport into the yeast cell. So those enzymes likely were delivered by this vesicular flow, but we further guessed that the lipids and membrane proteins of the, these vesicles would be the building blocks for expansion of the cell surface. So by fusion of a vesicle to the inner surface of the bud, the bud membrane would step by step grow as it acquired new mass. Now if that's true, then um, there's a simple prediction, and that is the genes required for the production and delivery and fusion of these vesicles would be essential genes. Just like the genes that are required for chromosome replication are essential genes. Now the way to study that in a microorganism is to produce conditional mutations, mutations that change, for instance, a single amino acid res residue, often on the surface of a protein, that converts it to a thermally unstable form. They're very often possible for essential genes to introduce such mutations randomly and to look for those that, cause the cell, that allow the cell to grow, for example, at room temperature, but which cause the mutant protein to unfold if the cell is warm to a higher temperature, something like 37 degrees. The overall effect of that will be to produce a cell that can form a colony on a petri plate if the plate is kept um, on a bench at room temperature, but the colony will not form if the cell, if the, uh, if the petri plate is um, moved to a, an incubator at 37 degrees. So it's a really very simple way of looking for mutations that, that define essential genes. Every time such a mutation occurs and you have a cell that grows at room temperature but not at 37 degrees, that indicates that that, that cell has a mutation in an essential gene. Now we guessed, given the complexity of the secretory pathway, that there may be many such genes. So we began a search for uh, such mutations in yeast using various uh, techniques. Here's the, here's the fellow who did all the work. His name is uh, Peter Novick. Uh, back, back then, we all had long hair. <laughs> I had much more hair than I have now. But uh, he was a brilliant graduate student. And um, I'll never forget when he first devised the procedure that allowed us to find a mutant, the first mutant called SEC1. He observed in very simple experiments that two different enzymes that would normally be secreted outside of the cell instead accumulate inside the cell when, these, when a culture of cells is warm to 37 degrees. So we're very excited about that. And just by chance, at this time, uh, George Pilati came to Berkeley for two special lectures. <clears throat> and I was excited to be able to tell him about our work. But most importantly, the students organized a dinner for him that evening. And Peter told him about his results with this m mutant, SEC1. And Pilati said, well, now, of course, you must examine this mutant cell by cutting a thin section to see what it looks like. And one of the great excitements in my career came two months later in the summer of 1978 when Peter called me from my office on the top floor of our research building down to the basement 
to look in the, on the screen of our, our, our electron microscope to see the following image. So recall the wild type cell with just a small number of vesicles under the surface of a bud. In this cell, sec one, when it's held at 37 degrees for a couple of hours, the vesicles continue to be made, but they have nowhere to go, and so they fill the entire cytoplasmic compartment. Thousands of such vesicles now build up because of a defect in a protein that we now know is required every time a vesicle must fuse with a target membrane. This gene, SEC1, is evolutionarily conserved, probably over two billion years of evolution. Uh, there is a neuronal version of SEC1 that is required to organize the fusion of synaptic vesicles at the presynaptic membrane. There is another form of SEC1 in the pancreatic beta cell that's required to organize the secretion of insulin from insulin granules. So this was enormously exciting and uh, suggested to us that there may be many <clears throat> more such genes. And so over the course of uh, the next several weeks, Peter simply looked at this mutant to try to think how we might uh, devise a procedure to isolate more such mutants. Instead of having to look randomly at colonies on a petri plate, for those that are simply temperature sensitive, was there something about this mutant that would allow us to produce an enriched uh, source of mutants defective in secretion? So Peter was really a very insightful young man. He um, observed first that when these mutant cells are held at 37 degrees and you simply look at them in the light microscope, they don't get any bigger. They, they fail to expand. They're not adding new surface membrane. And yet, evidently, they're making everything that would go into a new membrane. And so he guessed properly, he, gu he guessed correctly, that the cells increase in their internal density, so much so that we guessed that they could be separated from normal cells on a buoyant density gradient. This is a biochemist idea of a genetic selection. So here is that experiment, another really brilliant experiment of his. He took um, SEC1 mutant cells, genetically marked so that they could be distinguished by colony morphology from wild type cells. He mixed a 1% uh, SEC1 mutant cells with 99% wild type cells. He took the combined mixture and incubated it at 37 degrees for two hours. And he applied the sample to the top of a tube of a gradient material that forms a, a gradient when the centrifuge tube is simply put in a centrifuge and sedimented for some 20 minutes. He then uh, took the tube and punctured a hole in the bottom, collected drops, diluted them onto Petri plates. And I, I remember he lined up Petri plates along his bench and applied a stain that would allow SEC1 mutant colonies to be distinguished from wild type colonies just by a visual inspection. And he found that all of the SEC1 mutant colonies uh, were in, um, uh, represented in the fraction at the bottom of the tube, and all of the wild type yeast colonies uh, represented fractions at the top of the tube at the low buoyant density. So he had physically separated the mutant and wild type cells by this technique. We used this technique over the next uh, year and a half to isolate 220 more such mutations that defined almost two dozen different genes that we, were then, uh, we could then pursue and try to identify uh, the nature of the gene products. Here are some examples of some of the different phenotypes that we observed. The first such mutant, which accumulates vesicles, uh, well, that behavior was reproduced in 10 other mutations, defining 10 total genes. So obviously that last step, at least genetically and likely biochemically, is very complex. Another two mutants show this unusual uh, characteristic. When these cells are warmed to 37 degrees, they accumulate this structure, which looks very much like a mammalian Golgi body, uh, fills up quite a substantial fraction of the cytoplasm. Uh, this is never seen in a normal yeast cell, and we deduce that in this mutant, Proteins progress into this organelle, and they can't leave the organelle, so the organelle continues to get bigger and bigger. Um, like the other mutants, when this mutant is returned to room temperature, the permissive temperature, the organelle decomposes. It, uh, it uh, transfers material from the Golgi apparatus to the next step, and the secretory pathway resumes. 
And so we, con we could conclude with this and other mutants that the mutant protein is not only thermosensitive, but it is reversible. When the cell is returned to room temperature, the unfolded protein can refold and restore function. Finally, uh, another step was revealed when nine genes, uh, shown by this example, when the cells in this case are incubated at a restrictive temperature, this structure, the endoplasmic reticulum, proliferates quite dramatically. Uh, it's, dist it's distorted m beyond what we normally see in a wild-type cell. This is a section of the nucleus, and the envelope surrounding the nucleus is also distorted. And here again, we could show that secretory proteins accumulate in this organelle when the cell is held at the restrictive temperature, but when the cell is returned to permissive temperature, the secretory proteins progress through the next stages of the pathway. Well, using a combination of electron microscopy and genetic cytologic evaluation, we were able to put these, um, uh, some of these steps together in the form of a map uh, shown here, the temporal events in the secretory pathway. Um, this pathway, as seen in this cartoon, is very much like Pilate was able to demonstrate by his approach, but importantly, each of these steps, in our case, is populated by a number of genes, implying a number of specific protein molecules that execute each of the steps in this pathway. Now, after we'd assembled these mutants and were able to um, uh, reveal this pathway, uh, there was uh, something missing from the picture, and that is uh, none of the mutants that Novik had identified um, seemed likely to be defective in the channel of the ER membrane that Pilate had predicted would be required for the tr initial translocation event. That is, all of the mutants showed that secretory proteins accumulated inside of membranes inside of the cell, whereas if you had a mutation in the channel protein, you'd expect the secretory protein to build up in the cytoplasm of the cell, but not se segregated within a membrane. And so several years later, another brilliant graduate student shown here, Ray Deshaies, at one of our periodic big banquets celebrating some major discovery in the lab, <laughs> Ray, a, a really in incredibly a bright and talented fellow, devised a completely different approach, a genetic selection uh, that demanded that a secretory protein persist in the cytoplasm to allow the cell to grow. And as a result of that genetic selection, he defined a gene called SEC61, which we now know to be the major channel-forming protein, not only in yeast, but also in humans, and even in bacteria and archaea, a gene that has likely been uh, um, conserved through three to four billion years of evolution. Work conducted by um, his uh, wife, Linda Silvera, oops, which I'll um, talk about later, and Linda Hickey, whose work I'll talk about later, uh, followed on other observations concerning uh, the mechanism of vesicle formation. So again, going back to this uh, cartoon, we can define not only the genes that encode the channel, but we can define genes that are required for the formation of a vesicle, for its uh, trafficking to the Golgi apparatus, for the formation of vesicles that bud from the Golgi, and finally for the um, fusion of vesicles at the cell surface. Well, when this map became clear and the evidence was compelling that yeast cells use a pathway that is fundamentally evolutionarily conserved, the biotech industry growing up in the San Francisco area decided to use yeast as a platform for the production of useful quantities of clinically relevant proteins. And I helped one of the companies do this. They achieved two milestones in clinical medicine they were able <clears throat> to engineer the expression of human insulin in yeast by engineering the gene for human insulin and introducing it into a yeast cell that could trick the yeast cell into manufacturing substantial quantities of insulin that then flow along the yeast secretory pathway to be secreted into the culture medium of large fermentation vats. And now, one third of the world's supply of human recombinant insulin is made by secretion in yeast. They also were able to show that if they took the gene that encodes the surface protein of the hepatitis B virus and introduced that gene into yeast, 
That protein assembles into a membrane, it's an integral membrane protein, and persists in vesicles inside of yeast cells. And if any of you, and I suspect there are some in the room, have been vaccinated against hepatitis B infection, you have received an injection of yeast secretory vesicles that house that protein. That is the sole source of hep B vaccine in the world today. Hepatitis B infection often leads to uh, liver cancer. And so if the vaccine is successfully used around the world, the incidence of liver cancer is estimated to be uh, possibly reduced tenfold. So this has been a remarkable um, um, advance. Now, um, but still, uh, the, the fact that we have genes, the fact that we have mutants, the fact that we know that these operate at particular stations in the, in the pathway, uh, doesn't tell us what the gene products actually do. What are the proteins that are encoded by these genes? How do they operate? How do they coordinate with one another? What are the enzymes that execute the actual biochemical events that must proceed to organize this pathway? So it, was, um, uh, it took some years, but finally, another brilliant graduate student in my lab by the name of David Baker, whom I'll introduce in a moment, was able to make a connection through a biochemical experiment that allowed us to isolate functional forms of various sec proteins and then finally to connect at least one of them to a human disease. So here's this fellow, David Baker, who's gone on to his own quite remarkable uh, career uh, in ab initio protein design and protein structure prediction. But in my lab, he was a purely empirical biochemist. What he did was to devise a way of very gently breaking open yeast cells and in a lysate containing membranes and cytosolic proteins, he observed the, tr uh, the transport of a tracer, a radioactive tracer of a secretory protein into the ER, into vesicles that bud from the ER, and then into the Golgi apparatus, all occurring in a crude extract, a reaction that we estimate probably represented about the, the function of about 50 different protein molecules. Linda Hickey, whose picture I showed you earlier, showed that the reaction that Baker had devised was a reflection of the physiologic event because when she took one of the mutants defective in the traffic of proteins between the ER and Golgi and made a lysate of that mutant, she could show that the traffic event in vitro was temperature sensitive, unlike the reaction when you take a lysate of wild type cells. So that was really a key discovery that allowed us to conclude that Baker's reaction was an authentic reflection of the physiologic event and led us, over the course of several years, to isolate a number of the functional forms of these proteins. Now, following Baker's um, uh, technical development, another student in the lab, Michael Rexash, uh, wanted to devise a simpler reaction, one that would not require the 50 proteins that are probably required for the whole pathway that Baker revealed to be replicated. And so what uh, Rexash did was to devise a biochemical assay that allowed us to measure the formation of transport vesicles that bud from the ER in vitro. And that um, assay is shown here, a very simple assay. The way that um, Baker broke yeast cells open, Rexash showed, preserved the ER membrane in large envelopes so large that they sediment very rapidly when the lysate is simply put in a centrifuge and the centrifuge is turned on and off. The membranes are very large, they sediment very rapidly. So that's um, at the outset of this incubation. When these membranes are mixed with crude cytosolic proteins and ATP, during the course of a 20 minute incubation, Rexash observed the formation of small vesicles that were too small to be sedimented at low speed and they remain behind in the supernatant fraction after the large membranes are sedimented, and the small vesicles must then be sedimented at a much higher speed in an ultracentrifuge. Now, importantly, Raxas showed that the genes and proteins required to form vesicles that bud from the ER in yeast cells are the same genes and proteins that are required to uh, reproduce this biochemical event in the test tube. And using the same logic that Linda Hickey had used, he could show that when a mutant is temperature sensitive for the formation of vesicles in vivo, 
it was temperature sensitive in the cell-free reaction. As a result, after Rexash, a number of students marching in out of the cold room for, for several years managed to purify the full set of proteins that are required to bud a vesicle from the endoplasmic reticulum membrane. And we discovered, in collaboration with Leileo Orci at uh, the CMU in Geneva, that the vesicles that form in this reaction are quite uniform, with a diameter of about 90 uh, nanometers, and all are coated with a kind of a fuzzy electron-dense coat that consists of the very proteins that we added to this reaction to reproduce this budding event. If you isolate these vesicles and you mix them back with another source of crude membranes, the proteins that are in the vesicles can be delivered to the Golgi apparatus to complete the next step in the pathway. Now, although these, uh, uh, these images seem to suggest that the coat is kind of irregular and fuzzy, in fact, it's quite regular. A number of labs around the world have uh, used these purified proteins to uh, discover the atomic resolution structure of all of the subunits of what we call the COP2 coat. This coat operates not only in yeast, but in all eukaryotic cells. So here is a reflection at a low resolution. Um, much higher levels of resolution have been achieved that shows <coughs> the two layers of this COP2 coat with just a few words about how they work together. There's an inner layer of the coat consisting of three proteins that adhere directly to the cytoplasmic face of the ER membrane. And one of the proteins, this protein um, uh, here, uh, actually recognizes sequences on membrane proteins that are reporters of uh, traffic events that move these proteins to the next station. They are signals that are decoded by the coat subunit, this subunit, and um, um, uh, these proteins are bound by this complex of three molecules in the ER membrane. Then there's an outer layer of an unusual um, structure-forming protein consisting of two subunits that forms what was then the first example of this in biology of a polyhedron that is a cube octahedron with, uh, with um, square and triangular faces. The vertices of this complex are very labile, and this coat can assemble and disassemble quite rapidly in, um, in, in the cell and, of course, in, in vitro. And once the uh, outer layer of the coat envelops a vesicle, it um, surrounds a piece of membrane, pinching it from a donor membrane, and by a process of membrane fission, separates a vesicle from a donor membrane. The subunits of this coat are then shed, revealing a naked vesicle that then is delivered and uh, targeted to the Golgi apparatus for fusion. So we were content to work on this um, in yeast because of the advantages of genetic and biochemical analysis, but another postdoctoral fellow in the lab decided to work on this process in mammalian cells. He was able to reproduce the same biochemical event, and then we had a call, I had a call from a clinician then at Johns Hopkins University who, with a colleague in Saudi Arabia, had followed a family, a Bedouin family, with a rare craniofacial disorder uh, attributable to a mutation uh, in an invariant residue in this protein, part of the inner coat of the COP2 coat. Here are some of the patients in this Bedouin family, two siblings who uh, have a homozygous mutation in one of the copies of the human SEC23 gene. They develop cataracts at a young age. They have a facial dysmorphism. The soft spot, the fontanelle on the top of their head never closes. They have brittle bones, but they survive. And in spite of having a mutation in an absolutely invariant residue on the surface of the SEC23 molecule. Again, in collaboration with Orchi in Geneva, we had a look at skin biopsy samples taken from one of the children in comparison to one of his parents, a heterozygous carrier who showed no evident pathology, and further in comparison to a normal skin cell. And that image is shown here. If you focus first on the top, this is a thin section through a normal human skin cell with the ER membrane and some granular material in the luminal space. 
The second image in the middle is from one of the parents, a carrier um, with no evident pathology and yet with some distortion of the ER membrane. But notably, <clears throat> in the homozygous patient, the ER membrane is uh, remarkably distorted with an accumulation of material stain, granular staining material in the interior that we've shown is likely procollagen. So these cells, surprisingly, given this obvious pathology, these cells grow in the laboratory, they can secrete proteins, but they have a great deal of trouble secreting certain molecules, including uh, procollagen. Well, all of this was going uh, fine, and the lab was increasingly beginning to focus on problems of organization of collagen secretion in human cells when um, my life changed with a call in the middle of the night in October of 2013. Um, after a couple of months of um, busy preparation, my family and I traveled to Stockholm where um, I received this recognition from the King of Sweden. But one of the more memorable events that accompanied this, uh, these activities was a, an email that I received after the announcement of the Nobel Prize. Every year, laureates receive uh, a message from something called the Nobel Museum in Stockholm. And laureates are asked to uh, find something from their past that reflects the development of their interest in science or of their own particular research project. And I immediately recall that old microscope. Um, my parents fortunately saved that microscope. <clears throat> They mailed it up to me. Regrettably, neither of my children ever showed an interest in science. But fortunately, as a result of that, the microscope was not lost or damaged. And so I dusted it off. I sent it to Stockholm. And if you ever go to the Nobel Museum, you can visit my microscope on display <laughs> together with a caption in English and in Swedish about how I had to run away from home to begin my career in science. Now, if I have a few more minutes, I want to tell you about something that um, is uh, very important to me that uh, I've just begun, actually just a few months ago, something that will take me a little bit away from my normal laboratory work. For personal and professional interests, I've become very interested in Parkinson's disease, a, a disease that has a, an enormous influence on the aging population around the world. They're estimated to be tens of millions of patients with Parkinson's disease. And as the population ages, it will become even more uh, pronounced. It's the second most um, uh, damaging neurodegenerative disease after Alzheimer's disease. As um, in my case, my wife became more and more ill with this disease, I was approached by um, a representative of the Sergey Brin Family Foundation, Mr. Brin, the co-founder of Google, has a family history of Parkinson's disease. And as a result, he has a deep interest in promoting research on this disease. He's been very supportive of the work of something called the Michael J. Fox Foundation in the US. But more recently, he's decided to make a major push himself, uh, focused, as you'll see, entirely on basic science. Because although there are some things that can mitigate symptoms of patients with Parkinson's disease, there is no fundamental understanding of the origin or means of progression of the disease, and no effective treatment that changes that progression. And as a result, Mr. Brin, and I certainly support this, feels that a major push must, be, must now be undertaken to try to understand the molecular and cellular basis of this disease. And so I've agreed to take on this challenge to identify laboratories around the world and to engage them in an international network focused on certain aspects of the disease that I'll tell you about in the next uh, couple of minutes. This is um, a program called Aligning Science Across Parkinson's. Uh, a group of neuroscientists ha have, have met over a period of years to define several key initiatives that will be the underpinning of this effort I'll tell you about in a moment. Uh, the goal ultimately is to provide a strategy and a mechanism to direct financial assistance and human capital to solve this critical problem with basic science. And we will not be promoting clinical research. We will not be engaged in drug discovery. The, the goal we have is to understand why dopaminergic neurons die more rapidly in Parkinson patients. Because with a fundamental understanding of how that happens, one could be certain to have targets that will be revealed that could be used in 
uh, therapeutic approaches. Now we know a, a great deal about genes that um, are represent, represented in uh, families with the disease, and many of these genes have functions that are understood. They play roles in many different cellular processes, uh, calcium homeostasis, synaptic membrane biology and pathology, proteins like alpha-synuclein, which is one of the genes involved in Parkinson's disease, a protein that was first found uh, on synaptic vesicles and which interferes with vesicular traffic in mammalian cells. Other functions associated with mitochondrial survival and their disposal um, found in other genes in families with the disease, failures in protein degradation, um, cell death, and in neuroinflammatory process. And so the hope is that these elements will fit together in some kind of a puzzle, a puzzle that we haven't yet solved because it's too complicated, but, but uh, perhaps we can. And so finally then, the key elements of this uh, 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 proposal are to uh, make a concerted effort to follow the genes and the gene products in cellular processes and try to put them together in uh, this puzzle that I told you about a moment ago. There is uh, some considerable evidence that Parkinson's and other neurodegenerative diseases may be initiated or exacerbated by neuroinflammatory processes about which little, if anything, is currently known. There are even basic questions about the circuitry that intervene in um, a dopaminergic neurons uh, that um, touch these cells and that transmit information into or from the cells. So a basic understanding of the circuitry uh, is essential. Finally, there is very often a long prodromal phase of sometimes decades that precedes the development of the pathology. There are two symptoms that are often associated in patients long before the disease is evidence. One is a poorly se developed sense of smell. This, of course, is not uncommon, but people who have this poorly developed sense of smell when they eventually develop Parkinson's disease uh, have noted that, that connection. One that is rather more um, fundamentally connected is a, um, a, a symptom called uh, REM sleep disorder where patients um, have um, uh, live out their dreams while they're sleeping and can often flail around and become violent uh, during a sleep cycle. And it's, um, there's some remarkable evidence that there's a high correlation between that symptom and the development of the disease many years later. What is the basis of that, uh, that symptom or the poorly develop, developed sense of smell? What else is going on that may uh, ultimately be useful in identifying biomarkers that could be used to mark the progression of the disease? Well, there are many things that uh, we now need to learn, and this effort uh, it will begin this year that we'll put out a call, an RFA, for proposals. We're looking for teams of investigators. People have already established meaningful collaborations focused on these elements. And we're hoping to identify people who have that personality that they can engage in a meaningful collaboration and then engage them in a worldwide network to communicate and share results in an open uh, process. And perhaps with that approach, um, as well as the others that have been traditionally applied, will make some meaningful progress in the years ahead. And that's um, what I'm really looking forward to now. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>